morning, Arthur. Thank Good you for, for taking time to talk to us today. Uh, we're doing a series of films for the Massachusetts Center for the Book. I'm sure you remember Sharon Shalhou. I do. And she sends her regards. She said Good. to say hi to you today. Where is she now? In the East, right? She's at Simmons, mm -hmm. which is where the Bridget, office okay. of the Massachusetts yeah. Center for the Book is. Uh, got us to come over and, and visit is your annual festival which All is right. coming up this Sunday. I we have a beautiful course. day. Well, with the, everything, okay. the whole picture. But the festival kind of got us working as using that as kind of the centerpiece for filming the whole center and, and, and talking to you. Uh, I'll be coming back Sunday and we'll be filming the, the festival right. too. Right. Now, I spoke to you or uh, emailed you earlier and I've always been struck by how important festivals and pageants are in the Renaissance. How does your festival fit into that tradition? And how does it fit into the community? And well, how think, does it reflect the center? Yeah, I think you you picked the big word, which is community. It's a community event, and it's open and, and free to what would have been then a town or a village celebrating any number of days, often saints' days, but not always. Um, and we have tradesmen here to show what they're doing. I think they would have had that then. Uh, we have games for the kids. Um, we have some falcons. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have perhaps all the animals they had, but uh, it's it's sort of showing the productivity and the activity of of the town. Um, they were not, of course, concerned with the historical period because they were the historical period, and we're very concerned that what we do is authentically historical, which I think probably separates us from a number of the festivals that are more or less historical. I love Renaissance festivals. Uh, and the, a lot of them are very inauthentic. Uh, one of the things I really enjoyed about a Renaissance festival I went to one time was uh, they had pirates as part of the, mm -hmm. the entertainment, swashbuckling and sword fighting and everything else. And at night, these guys would go back to their camp because uh, it was a traveling Renaissance fair, and they were bikers. They were <laughs> motorcycle gang. And like I said, that is so perfect. Pirates, motorcycle gang, it still exists. Nothing's changed. That's so. right. So Renaissance fairs, however inauthentic they are, can still be a hoot. And uh, you know, so the, the community likes to come, not just scholars and students. Uh, well, you get a big turnout? Well, it's, it grows every year. And I oh, think really? it's probably big, yeah. bigger this year than before because we've added a number <clears throat> of things and we've done more advertising. And I think we're better known. Um, but Have you been doing this ever since you started the center? Uh, close to it. Okay. Uh, I would think the second or third year we tried it. The first year that we tried it, uh, we spent a year planning it, uh, and it poured rain. You never know, do you? So we rain. canceled everything uh, early in the morning. Uh, and I actually cried. <laughs> so, so upset that we had worked so long and so hard and had nothing to show for it. Um, but we've had pretty good weather since. The worst weather we've had, I think, was last year when it was cold and cold. It was drizzly. windy. And, yeah. um, and a number of people, I think, think most of the people who came stayed all day. Um, we reckoned we had around 600 people. Um, oh. And of course, they're all ages from all backgrounds, which is, again, the community of, of sort of local festivals that they would have had in the Renaissance. So we're very happy about that. One of the things Jeff was uh, talking about as we did the tour was uh, how the center is interdisciplinary and it encompasses so many things now. I've always thought of the Renaissance Center as kind of Shakespeare and a little bit of the Renaissance, but you have mm -hmm. gardening and cooking and music and science and even mentioned uh, one course uh, because I guess a professor of physics had donated some items uh, to the to the center and he said that there had been a course that somehow combined physics and the Renaissance. Is that anything we you remember? We had a conference on Galileo okay. uh, a couple of, of months ago. I, I Mm -hmm. I don't know what he's talking about, I guess. Yeah, but I, I guess just in terms of interdisciplinary, I guess, uh, you do that's right. you do cover everything. So you do yeah. have physics, you do have math, you do have uh, that's right. music, uh, dance, drama. I mean, you really uh, have... Some more it than could others, be everything. but, but right. uh, yeah. we try to get everything in. In, yeah. uh, in fact, when we started, we didn't have this building. We started with the dean's office, uh, hmm. which we deliberately used for our classes because she was not necessarily in any one department. Um, and we had one or two teachers who always combined two departments areas. Um, that's been less true here. We've got regular c courses from the university, mostly graduate courses in media. Uh, we've had one undergraduate course in Chaucer that was quite successful, but um, mostly it's been graduate courses. And then community courses, which are very popular. 
Um, I see that. Uh, I saw that on the website that uh, once a week you have lectures or classes that the community can, can come to. Is it that often? Five, five or five weeks, in, or six weeks now in the spring and fall we do. Okay. Called Renaissance Wednesdays. Uh, so it's always at four o'clock and, and on Wednesday. And we have concerts the first Sunday of every month, so that there's sort of a regulation to the to regular. Mm -hmm. Things uh, have really grown culture. here. You really uh, keep expanding uh, your right. offerings. It's amazing. Yeah. Give me a, a little idea of how uh, the center got started. This is your baby. You came up with the idea, and uh, how did it get started? What what uh, what was the seed to say, hey, I want to start a Renaissance Center? Uh, well, the, there are, I suppose, two different seeds. One is that we had a very strong Renaissance faculty. We had about 16 or 18 people in the Renaissance in the English department and a number of other Renaissance scholars in other fields. So there was a large number here, and we founded a, a journal which became pretty famous uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so we were a kind of headquarters for the Renaissance. I suppose that's one one reason. Is that the Sydney Journal or what? No, what journal? it's the English Literary, English oh, Literary yeah. Renaissance. Oh, okay. Right? Yes. Yellow. Okay. Uh, Sydney Journal came later, but okay. they're both upstairs in the publications office mm -hmm. now. Um, so we were really being established in the Renaissance. That was one reason. Another reason is that it when we discussed my continuing employment here, um, and I was had the year off of the Folger in Washington where I was doing research. Uh, I came up and we had a discussion and, and they said, what would you like here? And I said, a Renaissance Center. And I think I said it as I look back on it because I was at the Folger. I did not think that at the time. I just thought of that as a kind of outgrowth from the Renaissance faculty. But really I modeled this on the Folger and a little bit on the Huntington. And so I think probably deep in the recesses of what I have as a mind, um, there was a kind of echoing feeling that we could I, do that. Now here. that you've mentioned that, I do get that feeling. It's a more intimate, uh, you know, very focused collection, and uh, it does remind me, now that you mentioned a little bit of the Folger. Yeah. yeah. How did you personally become interested in the Renaissance? Uh, in graduate school, I went there as everybody enters graduate school doing American literature, right? That's what you know, what you grow up with, and what you like. Uh, but the, the, the most famous and the best scholars in the department I was in, I was in Ann Arbor, were all Renaissance. And, and when I thought about Shakespeare and Spencer and Milton uh, and Sidney and all the other people in the Renaissance, I thought this is really a very rich period. So that's the positive reason and probably the, far the strongest reason. But a, but a, but a secondary reason was the, was the 19th century because the 19th century had novels, which I liked. But all the novels are 3,000 pages long, and I didn't want to read them nor teach them. Um, I wanted something that was sort of manageable in at least one or two weeks of classes. Um, so the Renaissance appealed from the beginning, uh, once I met the faculty. Was uh, your early specialty in Shakespeare or Milton, Sidney? Who, who did you focus on at that point? Uh, at that point, I, I focused on Stephen Gosson, who's a, a minor author, but you do that in graduate school. Uh, and we had G.B. Harrison, who was <clears throat> one of the most famous editors of Shakespeare, and one of the things he taught was textual editing, and I thought, well, if I go out, I ought to be able to do textual editing. That's one of the skills I ought, or at least pieces of knowledge I ought to have. So I worked with G.B., uh, and that meant that I would edit something that was not major. Shakespeare had been edited, that uh, all the major people had. So I did Stephen Gosson, who criticized the theater and got into theater criticism in, in Shakespeare's period. Now, um, the Renaissance Center is part of uh, a network of, of libraries and museums, uh, at least in the Valley. How do you interact with the other museums and, and libraries in the Valley? Uh, I don't think we mm -hmm. interact very much with the other museums. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to have their specialties. We have nothing in common with Amherst Historical Society or the, the uh, Emily Dickinson Homestead, is it now? It was the house when I came here. It's, it's become, really expanded. It's become it's the amazing. Emily Dickinson yeah. Homestead. Yes. And we don't deal with that. We have our own homestead here. Yeah. Um, but we do try to partner with a number of, of things at the university and, and where we can in the town. Um, so, for example, all our refreshments now are supplied by the Amherst Women's Club, and we've got a very close tie with the Amherst Women's Club. We have a good tie with the Amherst Club, which has given us a number of docents that, that watch our reading room so mm -hmm. that people don't do destruction of the old books. Um, what did you think of the uh, idea of Massachusetts Center for the Book trying to encourage, I guess you could call it literary tourism or 
book tourism here in the valley because it is so rich both in libraries and uh, collections and writers and bookstores uh, to focus on the Connecticut Valley in Western Massachusetts as an entity, as a, as a place, you know, not, not Boston, not uh, New York, but having its own personality and, and its own heritage. Do you think that, that that's going to fly? Will people say, hey, let's go to Western Mass? And, it should. Yeah. Uh, it's the richest place I know for printing presses, Yes. for example, uh, for bookstores, mm -hmm. uh, for, for the printed book. Uh, and people like Barry Moser and Leonard Baskin have made it very famous for illustrations of those things and, and hand-produced uh, books, um, some of which I've worked on. Um, and, and I think we have, the place is filled with writers. When I, when I say that I write books, I'm not one of, of every second person you meet in this, in this valley. Uh, all of us are writing poems or stories mm -hmm. or essays um, or memoirs. Um, so Amherst Books can have local readings of, of new books by local authors every two days. Yeah. Uh, I don't know any place that rich, although I think probably in California we could find that kind of richness. But it's, it's very rare in this country, to my knowledge. And, uh, and so we all have things to talk about with each other and, and common interests in what we do in our daily lives. And I do think that the valley is compact enough that somebody visiting could, could see most everything. Mm -hmm. It's not... Uh, Overwhelming that they could hit the hit the high points Do you encourage any kind of tourists visiting here? Are there open hours that people can visit or is there any kind of time? That well, we're now on the web and we're now on Twitter and we're now on Facebook and we're getting a couple thousand hits Right regularly. So yes, I think I think we are we are spreading out, but that's fairly recent mm -hmm. um yeah, because the Folger is, is definitely a, a tourist attraction in, in Washington, D.C., and so is the Huntington. Not, not that people are going into the collections and handling the books, but they do have, right. have a, uh, a draw. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, they had that, that great whole exhibit space in the, the Folger and a number of really interesting exhibits and catalogs about them that they sell. We, we don't have that here yet, but um, we do have rare books, and we deliberately keep some of them in this office because I meet a number of people coming through, and I ask them if they'd like to look at a book so I can show them Dunn's Sermons in its first edition, for example, and, and they can handle the book. Uh, they get nervous often, but um, mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt the book to be handled. Well, one thing that you have here that's a little different uh, than, let's say, the Folger, maybe the Huntington uh, would fit into this, is that you have such beautiful grounds, and you have outdoor areas for performance and you know, the gardens and, and all of that. I think that that it really speaks to the valley in that not only do you have a very, uh, you know, rich collection, but you also have this beautiful scenery or uh, surroundings mm -hmm. that you aren't going to get in a city. And I think that that reflects uh, some of the culture of the valley that uh, you do have a rich culture, but you also have a, a beautiful countryside. Well, there we have partnerships again, too. Uh, Hampshire Shakespeare has moved here now. Yeah. We built them their own stage, which they have out in the, in the great, what we call the Great Meadow. This is a great place to perform. Yeah. That it is. Uh, and there's, there's ample parking, uh, and there's a good facility here. So uh, that happens through much of the summer, every summer. Um, and the Stockbridge School of Agriculture has helped us with the gardens, and we have had a number of gardening courses through Stockbridge that train the students in oh, Renaissance sure. gardening. Yeah. So um, I can tell you that our apple orchard has <coughs> something like a dozen uh, species of apples that were known in the Renaissance, <laughs> not Jeff just was, any apple. Jeff was telling me the names of yes. them. I had never heard of them. My son, Gabriel, is a, an arborist, and uh, he specializes in fruit trees. And he will be very thrilled to hear those names, and uh, I'm sure he'll know them. Did uh, Jeff, Jeff give you a blue packet that we have out here in the theater? No, no, I'll, I'll get that. <coughs> yeah. I take it home. Great. <coughs> now, uh, besides the uh, the theater uh, here, you also have a costume collection that must. Uh, well, that's the Hampshire this. Shakespeare Company's yeah. collection, but we house it here. Yeah. Um, yes, and it is available to the public. Uh, I think there's a small fee on that now, and they have to sign it out, and they have to return it in good condition, but we do let other people use the costumes. Does the uh, theater company make their own costumes? Is that they used to. I yeah. don't think they've been done much. Who, who makes the costumes years. now? Uh, I think nobody. I think I think we've been using the costumes that are there. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty, pretty extensive collection. It takes up half the barn and the top yeah. floor. 
That's really interesting. I mean, that's another interdisciplinary side to the uh, to the uh, to the center. Now, you have a new book coming out, um, Shakespeare in the Mind's Eye. Can you give us a uh, a preview of that? Sure. I have always been interested in how the Renaissance relates to us and how we can know more about the Renaissance directly because of our own experiences. <clears throat> so when cognitive science began to emerge, and I began reading people back then, uh, like Thomas Wright's Passions of the Mind in general, I realized that they had the basis of our notion of neuroscience. Um, so, for example, the first great anatomy of the brain, taking it all apart and understanding it in detail and illustrating it, was Vesalius in the early 16th century. Mm -hmm. And we now have his pictures of, of uh, detailing the, the anatomy of the brain and how it functions. So uh, this book suggests that Shakespeare, uh, through the readings of science in his own day, or the knowledge generally in this culture of the science in his own day, uh, would have had a sense of the mind working in the way we know the mind works. Now, in the specifics, we've advanced a long way, but certainly the general basis is the same. So that Shakespeare would have known this, absorbing it from the culture, if not from a book, uh, as he as he wrote his plays, he himself would think that way. His characters would think that way. So, we can understand things that that happen in the plays that have uh, not been thoroughly studied or have puzzled people. I began with the Winter's Tale, where Leontes is suddenly jealous of his wife for apparently no reason, and my my problem was, why does he get jealous of his wife? Well, neuroscience will tell us what happened that got him jealous of his wife. Uh, and so I've done an essay which, which tries to make that connection. Um, There's so many different uh, angles to come at Shakespeare. When I went to college, Freud was the way to look at Shakespeare. So right. it's, it's always great that uh, he can take so many different lenses aimed at him and, and still speak still around, to us. But I've never, I've never catered to Freud. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because the, the mm -hmm. most many, many not all, but certainly many of the Freudian critics tend to look for the pattern in the play that is Freudian and say, that's it, that's <laughs> the play. It all fits in there, and they will force parts of it if, if they have to. Right. Uh, and it all, always seems mm -hmm. to me to have the same conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not very, it's not very interesting. Right, to me. right. It's a Procrustean bed that they yeah. uh, put put poor old Shakespeare into. Uh, speaking of science, um, you're digitizing your collection. We are. You've uh, worked with digitized uh, texts before. You did a, a bibliometric analysis of Shakespeare at one time. Once you have your collection digitized, is this going to make scholarship of your collections? Different, easier, um, both. Okay, both, and I don't know what the outcome of, of that is going to be. Uh, it won't hurt us much, I think, because we, people are going to be coming here to, to see the gardens and to do other things as well. But uh, the Folger, for example, which is now digitizing much of its major collection, um, people won't need to go to the Folger. That, of course, will spread the value of the collection and the use of it, but it might empty out the Folger. Why go down there at, at considerable expense in Washington when you can do it from your own home? Uh, and, I, and I therefore don't know what the future of research libraries that specialized is, or in that sense, ours. Uh, the Huntington, however, and it, it, it quite amazed me. I got a, um, I was a Huntington fellow for a couple of times, and, and so I get their mail. And, and one of the things that they're doing now is, is raising money for, for collections, as they always do, and spending all of that money on old books. Mm -hmm. They're going the other direction than they're, what? They're, they're going in the other direction. Yeah. They're not digitizing. They are buying books. I think that that's a wise investment. I think that people that have the books in the future are going to be very happy. Uh, all the libraries that are dumping their collections and saying, you know, we don't need books. Uh, are going to have to come to you or whoever has the actual books because you never know what direction things are going to go. One of the things I've found uh, while I've been filming these videos is a really greatly renewed interest in binding, old-fashioned binding, mm -hmm. printing, using old-fashioned printing presses like the one you have in mm -hmm. your, your basement, paper making, the old artisanal ways of making books. And I think somebody like the Folger 
maybe you won't have the scholars coming to get the text because they can access it on their computer, but they will have the people coming to see how was this book made, and that will live on. I think uh, you never know what what's going to happen. It's like, oh, well, these are old and nobody cares anymore. There's a great interest in, in you know, rebuilding a lot of the the book building that, that has gone on. It's a seismic shift from reading a book to reading a digitized book, an yeah. electronic book. Uh, which I liken to moving from manuscript to book in the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. uh, that took them about 150 years to do. So it's not going to happen as quickly as people think. Somewhere I read recently there were more books published in the United States last year than any previous year. It's it's stunning. I think it's it's something like uh, a million books yeah. a year. Or, I mean, it's like you know 30,000 books a day are getting well, to me, published. Part of that larger number <clears throat> comes from something like collective copies. Sure. You can print your own now. Yeah. You couldn't do that 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, Self-publishing so is like, huge. Self-publishing yeah. is, is is widespread. But that's all right yeah. because it will keep that material. Yeah, I uh, have written a number of books, and I'm self-published. And you know, I, I sympathize with a lot of people that that go to a publisher, and the publisher is like got their nose in the air, and it's like, no, we won't publish you because we can't sell a million copies of your book. It's like, well, I, there's something I want to say, and I want to get it out. And mm -hmm. now with the internet, and uh, you know, being able to get uh, your book out, uh, whether it's an ebook or just getting it online, is is a great opportunity Absolutely. to to, uh, to have an audience and have people read what you're talking about. One uh, other thing about digitizing collections and digitizing texts, and, and you did this in a book uh, about Shakespeare's authorship, what do you think uh, data analysis or uh, you know, bibliometrics, I guess is the word, I'm not exactly sure what, uh, being able to go into the, the texts that are, are all scanned, what, what uh, doing word counts? I mean, is that something valuable? Is that something that we're going to see well, what more I of? Well, I learned, and, and, I, and I really learned this by going to Australia and working with the center over there, uh, which is the head center for computer studies in, mm -hmm. in Australia, uh, and I've been doing this for some time, um, is that everybody, including your lovely wife, who's behind the camera and working very hard, um, has a DNA of language. When she writes something of, of, say, a couple hundred lines, we can tell that it's hers and nobody else's. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Yeah, it's I amazing never about because that. We, yeah. I can talk to her. You know, we can talk in the same language, but somehow her her, her pattern of, of words, uh, her use of certain terms, mm -hmm. uh, is hers. Uh, and yours is yours, and mine is mine. And when when we and I, I couldn't believe that at, at first, but mm -hmm. when you sat me down, who runs that center, is a former student of mine at Oxford. Uh, when Hugh sat me down uh, and, and ran his program uh, and said, this must be by Shakespeare. Sure enough, it was Romeo and Juliet or something else, it was by Shakespeare. When he did it with another text, uh, it was, in fact, the author that we assigned to that text. Mm -hmm. So we began assigning things that were either controversial or unknown. Um, and we verified, I thought we had discovered, but we verified the fact that Arden of Faversham is partly by Shakespeare. Mm. Nobody had, had gone so far as to include that in the works of Shakespeare. But it will be, I think, from now on. Um, and there are others like that out to be discovered that we haven't really examined thoroughly yet. That's interesting. Well, Arthur, I thank you for your time and uh, the tour. And Patty and I are looking forward to coming back on Sunday and enjoying your festival. And Good. we may get a chance to talk to you again there. You'll may be, the flowers be blooming. Yeah, I think we have some good weather coming. So thanks for your time, Arthur. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate it. Good morning, Jeff. We're here at um, the Massachusetts Renaissance Center with Jeff Goodhind librarian and he's going to take us on a tour today we're going to see both the inside and the outside and then later we're going to talk with arthur kinney and we're going to come back on sunday to film the festival are you just about ready for the festival jeff uh never feels completely ready but <laughs> we're pretty close <laughs> yeah this weather's going to be nice um when was the renaissance center started the renaissance center was officially founded in 1998 um, <clears throat> The building itself was built in 1948. It was the private residence of uh, Toby and Janet Dakin. So Toby and Janet Dakin, uh, <clears throat> sorry, can you pause for a second? I've just got a thing in my throat. It's <clears throat> early in the morning. Yeah. 
just cut that part. Anyway. Yeah, we'll edit. <laughs> <laughs> Editing is great. So yeah, private residence of Toby and Janet Dakin. It was built in 1948. Um, Janet Dakin is probably familiar from the Dakin Animal Shelter. Uh, she was also sister to Thornton Wilder, the playwright. And they donated their house to the University of Massachusetts and eventually became the Renaissance Center, um, thanks mostly to Arthur Kinney and the Chancellor at the time, which he can tell you a bit more about since I was not employed here at the time. What was their connection to UMass and uh, what was their connection to the Renaissance? I mean uh, as far as their connection to UMass goes, they were looking, I think, for the right place to donate the house. And as far as the Renaissance goes, nothing in particular, <laughs> aside from Janet Dakin's uh, great affection for raising horses. Okay. It's a beautiful setting, and it really does evoke uh, the Renaissance with the, the beautiful gardens and the, the beautiful architecture. And the look of the house itself uh, strongly resembles an English Cotswold cottage, uh, which is one of the reasons that it was extremely appealing to us as a... Uh, <clears throat> place to have the facility. And also out here then we've made a lot of changes since the uh, inception of the Renaissance Center, most notably these gardens. Uh, we have many, many gardens which I'll be taking on a tour of, but the ones we have out here begins with our herb garden, which is in a bit of disarray right now. It was a very difficult winter, but that's this garden here. Then this is our knot garden. Um, which has been around since not too long after the founding of the center itself. And this garden came about, give me a second to look it up exactly because it's a long list. Right, so, uh, responsible for giving us this nod garden includes the president at the time, William Bulger, the uh, state senator Stan Rosenberg, state representative Ellen Story, Hampshire College and the Carl Swanson family helped uh, donate all of this. Most everything we have here, garden and book, is very related to donations. We subsist very, very strongly on them. Um, yeah, they're kind of how we get by. Do you try to uh, have plantings that would evoke the Renaissance? Or is this like an English garden from the Renaissance times? Or We do, in fact. That's one of the big reasons uh, I had <coughs> So one of the big ways these are designed is by intending to evoke the Renaissance. So this knot garden is a very common English thing. Um, we used to have yews out here, and now I don't remember what these are, so don't record that. <laughs> um, the herbs are intended to be the same way, and the ones in the back equally so, and on the side, in fact, even more so. So I should probably go this way and show you that. Let's go second. take a look. Great. So behind me, we have our vegetable and herb garden. It was originally designed and created by a collaboration with Stockbridge School of Agriculture, and so the School of Agriculture is also now helping us maintain it, and for that we're very, very grateful. It's probably one of our most successful collaborations. Uh, it's meant to um, be a recreation of a uh, Renaissance-era kitchen garden, so you'd find vegetables and herbs in here, the same that you would find in any kind of Renaissance kitchen. Um, some of the research that also went into the creation of this includes some rare books that are down in our collection itself, which I can show off in a little while. Do you do any cooking with uh, these herbs? And we have uh, pulled out a few of them on occasion to use, uh, mostly uh, during our Renaissance banquet. Um, nice. So a few bits here and there. Um, and it's just been a really wonderful thing also to get the community involved, to get people seeing what these gardens would actually look like. So you have somebody from Stockbridge. Uh, are they like a permanent fixture here, or what is their...? They're a regular seasonal fixture. We have a student right now named Ruth DeBono who um, does really excellent work uh, for basically the springtime. I think her official start date might be tomorrow. And um, we get her, you know, until the fall when it's time to put this whole thing away for a while and uh, we'll be lost when she graduates, but hopefully we'll find someone else. <laughs> Sounds good. And our other big uh, one of our other big collaborative efforts led to this orchard behind me. And if it weren't such a terrible, terrible winter, it'd be looking much nicer right now. Um, <clears throat> UMass Extension and Cold Spring Orchard helped uh, put this together for us. Uh, this was in 2012, and so we should be on our first year of them actually bearing fruit. Uh, Wes Audio is the person over there who gave us uh, the most help with that. All of the varieties of apples you'd have here are from the same rootstocks you would have in the Renaissance, so this is as close to authentic as we can make it. Um, are these all apples? Yep, these are all apples. So, <clears throat> yes, we have such varieties as Court Pont du Plat. Mm, Old Permain. 
and Old Non Pariah. Um, wow, I've never heard of any of those. <laughs> yeah, you won't find Golden Delicious here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm glad to see somebody keeping this, uh, these root stocks going. Okay. The Grotto is one of our newest uh, garden fixtures. Uh, it's donated the name of Otto and Diane Stein, who uh, have been great supporters of the centers over the years and donated a lot of the trees you also see on this property. I'd be remiss right now also if I didn't mention Ellen Cosmer, our uh, garden designer and coordinator. She uh, really does all the hard work for this. And it leads to wonderful fixtures like this, and very soon this area over here, which very soon this area over here, which is now currently just barren, we had it cleared out by goats um, about a year or so ago now. That'll start having new plantings in there as well, so very soon that'll also be <clears throat> yet another one of our gardens. This is a beautiful shot out across the mountains and the field. We'll get a better shot in a minute. Yeah, we'll go. Ahead. And so we have the view, which is certainly one of the nicest parts of the property. And out here in this field is where all our festival is going to be taking place next week, which is what the little white flags are for. Soon there'll be tents, just to make sure that we can have the festivities rain or shine. Around the corner is where Hampshire Shakespeare sets up their stage, and they perform here every summer outside. And they've, we've been in partnership with them now for, I think, three or four years of having them per, uh, performing out here. <clears throat> so we bring in the community for that as well. Uh, also running around the field is the Kestrel Trail. It's about three quarters of a mile in case anyone needs to take a walk out there and it's always open. And then we have these gardens over here. Oh, I should also mention before the gardens is our patio area right here is actually also uh, can also double as a performance space for people who uh, wish to conduct performances like that. The brick out here kind of mimics a thrust that you'd see on certain period stages. How far down does your property go? So this area, this whole field area out here is all UMass owned conservation land basically. So the tree lines all in these directions is uh, more or less part of this place. Now by the Kestrel Trail, is that because of the Kestrel Trust? Yes, they used to uh, help maintain the trail here. There also used to be a Kestrel Habitat, um, which once it became properly conserved as the Kestrel Habitat, the Kestrels left and never came back. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> they liked it more wild, I guess. I, I guess so. Well, this is just beautiful on such a beautiful day, too. So a few of our other gardens include the uh, Walter Shmielewski Performance Garden here, and then further down, the Shakespeare Garden. Um, actually, hold on one second. Yep, okay, I was right about that. Um, yeah, and then further down our Shakespeare Garden. Uh, the Shakespeare Garden was designed in part by Dennis Porter, who uh, was working m predominantly from the works of Shakespeare itself to create the plantings that we have out there. Salt mug. You know, that's just like a mug with Shakespeare insults. Um, I own three, I think because everyone buys them for me for whatever holiday that might roll around. <laughs> you must get a lot of weird Shakespeare stuff. Uh, like I said, I saw these Shakespeare candies, a Shakespeare candle. Yeah. The number of tchotchkes must be infinite with, uh, with Shakespeare. And you can find a whole lot of them in almost every local store we've discovered. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you open your gift shop, you know what to, to put in here. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the trees we have in the background here are both donated by Otto and Diane Stein. And then around the corner here we have the Scholar's Retreat which is a nice little sitting area and uh, <clears throat> you know sometimes or at least we hope to have graduate seminars and that sort of thing sitting out here on days like today. So that's kind of the complete run of our gardens which as you can see more or less circle the entire property. So this is the Renaissance Center but your focus really is on Shakespeare? Uh, our focus is on the entirety of the Renaissance. Um, we actually sometimes get a reputation that our focus is on Shakespeare, but the reality is that we cover all aspects of the Renaissance, be it music or literature or history or science. So the collection is much more broad than you would, uh, than you would think at the beginning. So hopefully by the end of this, I'll show you exactly how much we have that's different. I'm looking forward to it. Let's go inside. Excellent. Here we are in the reading room. The Renaissance Center. Beautiful space, beautiful books, beautiful view. Jeff is going to show us around the interior now of uh, the Renaissance Center. Hey, Jeff, uh, what have you got in here to tell us about? Well, this is our reading room. This is uh, 
kind of the hub of the center. So this is normally open uh, 10 to 4, Monday through Friday, for people to come in, study, work, and conduct research. Um, that's community members, grad students, uh, independent scholars, uh, other faculty, that sort of thing. So anyone interested is welcome to come here and conduct research on Renaissance subjects. Um, on the walls here are all of our reference volumes. Um, that includes uh, Dictionary of National Biography, short title catalog, language dictionaries, kind of the essential reference works that you need to conduct research in the Renaissance. And then to go along with that, we have uh, some items on display here. These are just a few little pieces from the collection. The collection itself is much more extensive, but over here we have a pair of English indentures, one from 1650, one from 1690. Um, and then in the cases, we keep displays of some of our rare books. These are rotating on a, I'd say regular basis, but it's very dependent on when I actually assemble a new one. This most recent one here is on the emblem book tradition. So there are a lot of very nice pieces in here containing lots of engravings and emblems. Uh, emblem books being something, you know, you have an image that's meant to illustrate some kind of a moral point or parable. They're beautiful. Yeah, I'll get some still photographs and we'll overlay them so that we can get a look. That'll be, that'll be wonderful. We've uh, got a few map pieces up here and we have a lot more also located elsewhere which I can show you later. Um, so these are meant to be representations of maps that you would have and keep on the front of your horse when you were riding and kind of scroll down the further along you went. Oh my goodness. And yeah, or AAA triptychs, as uh, Arthur is fond of saying. <laughs> the, Nothing uh, is new under the sun. <laughs> absolutely <point> not. <laughs> this is our curio cabinet over here, which contains some items uh, that would be uh, present in the Renaissance that we've managed to get our hands on, sometimes coins, a few household utensils. This particular leaf uh, from the Psalms in a French Book of Hours is uh, circa 1375, My so goodness. it's one of our older pieces. Um, and a few of these are also replicas, but mostly these are all period, um, including down the bottom, we don't have a name on, a date on it, but the case on the lower right there is a specifically a case designated for the transportation of the Quran, um, because we like to cover all aspects of the Renaissance and not just Europe. Interesting, I didn't know that. So, and the rest of the time, if this room's not being used for study, it's here for lectures or concerts. Um, so come here during the festival and this room will look very different. I've seen seminars going on in here and this is just a great table to meet around. Mm -hmm. Great, let's see the rest of this place. And I, yeah. I, as I said, I'll come back, I'll get some still pictures of all the things that you just mentioned. So this is uh, the Carl P. Swanson room. It's named uh, after uh, Professor of Physics Carl Swanson, who um, taught in uh, one of the first interdisciplinary classes at the university with Arthur Kinney. And that's an important element of the Renaissance Center is the uh, interdisciplinarity. So the idea that you can have collaborations between professors of English and astrophysics. Um, How does that work? Well, Arthur can tell you more about that one. <laughs> um, what also we have here, so this is our kind of seminar room for uh, grad courses occasionally, afternoon meetings, and also where we serve all the food after our events. Some of the pieces we have on the wall here uh, tend to be related to the gardens themselves, um, which is nice because you can see the vegetable garden right out the window here. So this is a leaf from 1557 edition of Adam Lonister's Kreuter book, um, which I'll be talking more about later. Same thing over here, we have leaves from Gerard's Herbal uh, from 1597 and a view of the Heidelberg Castle um, and the gardens outside there. And I'll also be talking more about Gerard's Herbal and Adam Lonister's Kreuter book in a little while. So we're down in the basement, which is more interesting than it sounds. Uh, the basement <laughs> down here is kind of the it's heart the of dungeon. the center. Yeah, indeed. This is very much the heart of the center. What we have is our printing press, which I'll show you in a second and then also the collection itself. I like to start with the uh, actual process of printing in the Renaissance because, well, I think it gives people a slightly greater appreciation for the books they're about to look at. So what we have here are cases of type. Each and every one of these is filled with, well, <clears throat> uh, lots of different fonts. So every type case, we, ours are all laid out in a California job case style, which 
looks something like this. So this is where each individual letter will be. And this is what people would be working with, something similar like this. So knowing your layout type itself is made out of lead. <laughs> where did you get this collection of type and fonts and things? Uh, a lot of this was donated uh, through a collaboration with Hampshire College. And then the rest we've also kind of purchased and had via donor before. So this year we've got the letter A. Holding up, yeah, it's right side up. <laughs> so this is a piece of lead font, and this is about, uh, this is not about, it is 30 point. So uh, eight point is substantially harder to see, and in my hand this is pretty tiny. Uh, the little notch at the top here is so you know which side is up, because when you're working with this sort of thing, you wanna go, you know, quickly, so you don't have to check your work as much. So. <clears throat> do you do any printing with these? Uh... We have in the past, in fact, so here and here are two broadsides we've printed on the press itself. This uh, we made, uh, made several hundred of these when the press itself was dedicated in 2008. And uh, this was uh, from 2009. This was a uh, part of a poetry competition um, bet uh, for uh, students of the five colleges. And this is the uh, winning poem. So we've done things like that in the past, usually a small runs of in poetry contests or other kind of keepsakes. It's really cool down here. So you'd start with your manuscript and you would establish by, um, exactly how many letters per line you'd be working with. And then the compositor starts setting the type. He sets his font up in this area, looking at the manuscript, and then he has this thing in his hand, which is called the composing stick. And then one by one, he takes the type and puts it in one by one, just like that, more or less, until he fills out the line. Then once it fills out, he has to then make sure it fits very snugly, not too snug, just snug enough, um, which usually use then little pieces of lead to uh, justify the line. And then you have the uh, part where it doesn't fit and there's profanity and a lot more things are moved around until eventually you get your actual lines of type. Then, one by one, those lines get moved over to a form over here, so you'll probably want to come closer for this. Again, I'll get a uh, still photograph to, to get oh, yeah. a, a more clear. That'd be a fine idea. So you have your actual type put in here with lead between the lines to get the proper spacing. Then it's surrounded by these wooden blocks. Then uh, these things are called coins, um, and they're locked in by this key, which causes them to expand. So when you do that, it then fits snugly into the frame. Uh, frame something like this, so you'd have freestanding type held in by coins, pushing it in every direction. Then you very carefully take it over to the press, um, since it should fit snug, but you really do not want to drop that on the floor. There's a lot more interest in letterpress and uh, old styles of, of printing. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Bill Muller over at uh, Big Wheel Press. I think people mm -hmm. like the tactile feel of the paper and the indentation of the letters. And Yeah, it's very... It, uh, it just is uh, something you aren't going to get out of a uh, laser printer. No, no, it's a, really, it's a really interesting process. It can be very frustrating, but it's also extremely rewarding just to be able to do it and see it all come together. Um, so yeah, hand press work can be very, very rewarding. Great. This is our press. Um, the full story about how it came to the center, you should ask Arthur about later, since again, before my time. So anyway though, this is uh, a cast iron hand press. Uh, Stansberry is the model. Um, this is a specifically from the 1800s. Uh, an actual Renaissance era hand press would have a wooden frame and beyond that be almost entirely the same mechanism. So this is very, very representative of the type of press you'd see in the Renaissance. So. What you would have then, after they've set all the type, is it's all laid out here um, on this bed. And so you can see we have just a little bit of type here right now. <clears throat> then you would have two people working this. One would be preparing the ink and the other would be operating the press. Uh, I'm on the side where the ink would be. So what you have is one person's over here with his pile of wet paper. You need the paper to be somewhat damp in order to properly press the ink into it because it doesn't just sit on the surface. Um, so he would be affixing it. 
the paper would be affixed here. There would be a hole cut in this space to allow the actual type to be there. Um, so while he's doing that, the other person is preparing the ink, which would be over here, and he would be putting it on these uh, wooden balls with leather over them and rubbing them together like this and then beating it across the surface of the type itself. We use a roller, which is a substantially later innovation. Uh, the rubber washers required for this had not been in place, so we cheat. Um, <laughs> the ink is then beat across the top of this. Then once that happens, the other gentleman closes this, rolls it in, and pulls the press across. This pushes down, and you're off. Many Renaissance-era presses, which would be printing full-on books, would be much larger in size. Uh, the reason being so you could have a much larger layout. Since most books were not just a single sheet, usually it's a sheet that then is folded some number of times, uh, possibly quite a few times. You have, let me see if I've got an example here. Excellent. So, <clears throat> these are my very, very crude uh, designs that I use. Let's say it's a folio, which is a book that's been folded once. You'd have sheets one and four. Side, you'd have these side by side, so printed on the same sheet of paper. Then two and three printed on the other side. Then it would be folded, um, usually gathered with other groups. When you're looking for something that has a whole lot more pages, you'll have you know type layout something like this. I feel dyslexic looking at that. Yeah, I, I can only sometimes make sense of them. <laughs> Now, this press doesn't look that much different than something Gutenberg would have been using. No, it's very, very similar. The, once, the, once they have the hand press kind of set and ready to go, it does not change dramatically for many hundred years until really we move on to machine press. There's a similar press over at uh, the Gazette in Northampton uh, that they used uh, for their original printing of over 200 years ago, sitting in their lobby. Yeah, there's... It's nice that these things also were built to last. <laughs> and this is the one that you use to print those poems and yep. other things. On. So I'm yep. glad to see this. This is great. Yeah, yeah it's I a never nice knew you guys had this. I think a lot of people would be interested to see this. I, I actually get the uh, lines, I never know you had whatever, <laughs> quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So now we're very glad to uh, do what we can to promote ourselves and let everyone know that we're here. Great. Um, yeah, and I should also mention this as far as if you're interested in printing, the Museum of Printing in Andover, Massachusetts rooms like this. Just so many rooms there. They're a really great resource. Excellent. Do you get types and fonts and things from them? Mm-hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. So welcome to the collection room. This is the heart of the Renaissance Center. Uh, this, yeah, this library is definitely the heart of the place. Uh, what you're seeing right around me is our collection of rare books. This is over a thousand books from the hand press period, so made very much on machines like the one outside, mostly just bigger, and again, the wooden frames. Um, this is covers a variety of subjects that we have here, and I'll give you a lot of examples of it. We'll take a look at later uh, upstairs. But this covers all of that, all aspects of the Renaissance. So we have works of history, works of literature, a uh, great deal on religion, uh, bits about science, uh, philosophy. Many different languages are represented here too. So you have Latin, Greek, French, Italian. And this entire collection is uh, publicly accessible, so if someone comes in and they want to take a look at anything we have here, I'm happy to bring it upstairs and then very closely watch them read it. But This is a great resource in that you let people actually handle the books. I've always said that that was really the way to go, I mean, to experience the book. Yeah, there's not much point we find if uh, we have this collection, particularly because we think of our library as a teaching library. It doesn't really educate very much unless people can actually look at it and understand and really know the process that went into that. Yeah, sure. So yeah, we have a lot of things here in their primary resources, you know, for teaching. So it's education. That means people need to be able to actually take a look at these. Um, and some of these books also, you know, they're not always in the best of repair. Um, but one of the novelties of that is, you know, once you have the back cover falling off, you can really see the construction underneath it and see how the book is made. So. Even in that respect, there's a lot of use there. It's amazing, though, how well these books have held up all of these years. Some of these were really built to last. You know, some had conservation work in some of them. You know, that's they're basically unchanged, and they were sturdy. It was a very different kind of book manufactured back then. The paper and all that, that was really, really meant to last. And the rest of this place and it has shelves running in 
uh, both directions is all Renaissance scholarship. So it's everything we can get our hands on related to the Renaissance. So we have a lot of strengths of literature of both English, Spanish, and Italian. Uh, history, we're very strong in. Religion is a very big subject for writing in the Renaissance, and we have a lot of uh, secondary scholarship on that. Theater is one of our strengths. Shakespeare and his contemporaries. Um, art, we have a very extensive uh, collection of art books. Uh, Early America is a collection we're developing, trying to get more material on that. Um, and then also there's music. Uh, which is a newly expanding collection for us, and science is a kind of, is an important one for us as well. And food and cooking and gardens have also obviously been expanded based on our new efforts. And those are all the books on food in general are consulted by the cooking staff before our Renaissance banquet every year. So um, when you attend a Renaissance banquet, which is in October, uh, which you should all attend, you'll be eating food that's you know recreated from the Renaissance. You really do cover all of the bases. I'm mean, I'm really fascinated by that. It was uh, such a the Renaissance is such an important time for the developing of all kinds of thought, not just one kind of thought. But it was such an encompassing thing that, uh, yeah, to not try to cover all of it would kind of be selling it short. So I brought up a few of uh, the highlights from the collection, and I admit it probably went a little overboard just because it's also extremely interesting. So I'll go through a few of them really quickly. Uh, this particular one uh, doesn't look like much from the outside with this kind of hideous wood paneling thing. The music binding it is uh, a little bit more interesting, so this is probably 16th century. Uh, but inside, if I hold it right side up, that's better. Inside, this is a Bible with a commentary of Nicholas of Lyra on the outside. So you have text of the Bible here and then the commentary all along the outside. This is from 1495. It's uh, the oldest book in the collection. Not the oldest thing, but book-wise, this is the oldest we have, which... Again, and, and again, it's in perfect shape. <laughs> you would not know it from the outside, but the paper on the inside is in you know, fantastic shape. This is held up phenomenally well. So, What kind of paper is that printed on? Uh, this is laid paper. So this would have been made from linen. Um, basically, to make paper in this day and age, you uh, take uh, linen rags, bash them until they're kind of a pulp and uh, mix them with water. Then you put them in a frame and let it all dry out and then you get paper, which is why this has a lot of uh, lines along it. That's from the frame itself. Is it's, that what all those rag merchants were doing, is getting rags for paper? Yes, most likely. Um, and, be, and linen was not very common in England, um, mostly because it was so cold that everyone's small clothes are made of wool instead of linen. You don't have much of a white paper trade in England for a very long time, so. Interesting. Uh, this uh, has been rebound. This is not an original binding, but it's a 1632 copy of the essays of Francis Bacon. So they contain, uh, let's see, yes, uh, his essays including of regiment of health, of building, of vicissitude of things, of, uh, let's see, of atheism, of counsel, and a whole lot of other bits of his advice. Um, essays like this, you know common enough in the Renaissance, and this is a particularly famous one because, well, Francis Bacon. Um, another important essay writer of the time, well, an important person of the period, uh, just in general, was Erasmus, the father of humanism. I also bring this book up because it's one of our smallest. What would you call that size printing? Uh, this book is probably a 16 um, okay. meaning, you know, it was folded a whole lot. <laughs> Um, give me a second, sorry, folio, I should actually know this, sorry, folio folded once, quarto folded twice, octavo three times, yes, sixteen mo folded four times, basically. And so you have the very tiny little portrait of Erasmus. Let me get in on that. He would appreciate being filmed. Very nice. And it's just so very tiny is the other reason it's like showing it. This one is a breviary. This is probably one of the probably the smallest book we've got. Um, what's great about this one is that its hinges are still the uh, these clasps here are still intact. So if I wanted to actually clasp this thing closed, I could, but I don't. It's unnecessary wear, and the binding itself is extremely tight. So for me to open it at all is somewhat difficult. Um, these maybe, would have been the original pocket books. You'd carry yep. these around in your yep something cloak like that or something. And yeah, this other one I have is an interest book. This is a very handy little book in that 
yes, it's called an interest book, is entirely about calculating interest. So it's just table after table since they don't have a calculator. So, so that does uh, some of your math, your crossover into mathematics. And yep. So if you, uh, yeah, if you're keeping track of that sort of number thing, this is a very handy kind of thing to carry around with you. Um, other famous type works we have is this is a 1589 copy of Machiavelli's The Prince. So this is in Latin. And this is basically one of the books that's uh, responsible for founding modern political thought. So, yeah, this is, again, 1589, Machiavelli's Beautiful binding. Yeah. Prince. Yeah, and this looks relatively contemporary. Uh, this was probably added later, but this vellum on the outside is, yeah, contemporary from the look of it. One of my personal favorites is this, a... 1503 edition of the works of Euripides. Uh, this is by the Aldean Press from Venice, uh, one of the very famous early printing houses, which went from generation to generation. Um, what you have here is Greek type, which is extremely difficult to make. So this uh, took a lot of work to produce. Um, and uh, yeah, this is from 1503. So it's also one of our oldest pieces. And I'm just very fond of it since Greek is uh, one of my areas of interest. So they did make some of the most beautiful books. The typesetting and the layout is, is classic and this is imitated. Looks just today. wonderful. Yeah. The binding has, uh, uh, I think it's 18th century, so that's been redone. We have, speaking of mathematics earlier, a uh, 1680 copy of uh, Wilkins' Mathematical Magic. So this is uh, mostly <laughs> a scientific book and a book also about mechanical things having some very nice illustrations of some ideas he has. And so we have the wonders of uh, mathematics producing something like this. Wow. Shoot all those arrows at once. I like that. Yeah. Or my other favorite Looks image. like something that uh, a kid would come up with. Indeed. Speaking of something that looks like something a kid would come up with, you have uh, this cart here that would be propelled by wind um, <laughs> is the idea behind it. So. Okay. So this is kind of an interesting book of uh, theory. So moving right along, this is the extremely fast version. Oh, I missed Heliodorus. Uh, Arthur would be so upset if I missed Heliodorus. Heliodorus is a uh, Greek romantic writer. He was extremely influential to Renaissance writing. This is, book is the, uh, well, this is the only book by Heliodorus. It's called the Ethiopica, or sometimes just Heliodorus. Um, this is a story of Ethiopia. It's a romance of a young woman who is born in Ethiopia. She's born white um, because her mother uh, gazed upon a portrait of Aphrodite at the time of conception. So there are some questions of parenthood. Then uh, there's a lot of fleeing and a hero shows up and they travel the world. They're chased by pirates, monsters, etc. There's some very a great deal of excitement. It all works out in the end. Sounds very modern. It was very, very, very influential to Renaissance stories. Um, a lot of action. Indeed. Uh, what I also like about this copy is, you know, we have a little damage here, so you can actually see how the binding was put together. Yeah, that's perfect. A little archaeology of, uh, of binding going on there. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why, again, we like having ones that have fallen apart a little. Um, also, by Erasmus, uh, this is his uh, encomium of Thomas More. This one's in tough shape, but Thomas More is one of the other extremely influential people of the Renaissance. Pardon me for a second, it's easy for me to open it like this. So, mostly I have this just because Erasmus is such an important writer, it's nice to point out all of our Erasmus, of which we have quite a bit more. There's, this is only a very, very small sample of what we have downstairs, based entirely on what I grabbed at hand because I thought it was interesting, but I honestly could pull almost anything off the shelf and I would have something interesting to say about it if I... You have large collections of uh, Erasmus yeah. and Sir Thomas More, who yeah. else? Um, Erasmus, Sir Thomas More, one of our bigger writers that we have quite a bit of is, where is he? That's Thomas Haywood. Did I not bring up a Philip Sidney? I might not have. Um, Philip Sidney's uh, Counts of Pembroke's Arcadia, one moment please, is one of our big collections. So Philip Sidney's uh, Arcadia is one of the uh, great important romantic writings of the Renaissance, and we have uh, five or six copies of it. Um, because, well, it's ever so important. This is 1605 on top here and a 1674 edition of the Arcadia. Um, 
Illustrator. There is one moment. That one is unfortunately, the older of them is unfortunately missing its uh, title page that was removed a long time ago before we got it. And this one mostly just has the embellishments across the top of the page, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Our other large collection, the thing you get the most of if you're working in the Renaissance is you get a lot of Bibles. So I showed off that uh, 1495 one, but trust me, there are many, many more. Also in religious writing, you have uh, this book, Nisenios Quare Samale, which in and of itself, the interior is uh, religious writing, which is interesting, but it's the exterior that I like even more. This was bound in paper waste, um, both here and here. These were part of, these were two papal bulls um, from a much earlier time. These are both uh, late medieval. Um, so they had this lying around the shop as waste and they used it to uh, wrap this book in. So here's an example where the exterior is, at least to me, more interesting than the interior. A lot of important books or fragments have been found just as being used as binding or filler. There, there's lots of pieces of theater that we only know it even existed because we found a title page somewhere and that's about all we have on it. So, which one's this? All oh, right. Also in the land of book archaeology. I'll transition from every book by saying speaking of. This is the works of Louis Gondora, um, a uh, poet and great writer of Spain, referred to some as the Spanish Homer. Um, so you have all of his works contained herein. Um, but what also it makes this particular copy interesting is this portion here, where in a place that wasn't the Renaissance Center before we received this, it was chewed on by rats. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, they had good taste. Well, they uh, never actually touched the type. So if you can see in the corner and such, once they get near the ink, they kind of just give up. So very little of the type has been damaged. They just chewed around the edges. Mm -hmm. They were literary critics. Mm -hmm. So here we have, this is a 1609 copy of uh, Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen and the Shepherd's Calendar. We have a very nice title page here. Unfortunately also the hinges have become completely detached, so it's a little tricky to handle. Um, but Spencer is one of the other great important romantic writers alongside Sidney in the uh, English Renaissance. <clears throat> so yeah, we have a detached cover here. Usually if a book is going to fail, uh, the, the hinge is about usually where it does. This, missing its cover entirely, is a 1520 edition of uh, Savonarola's Preachings on Exodus. So this is the series of sermons that Savonarola preached um, right before they uh, got rid of him. <laughs> he uh, was, had promised not to uh, do any more preaching, and so then he returned to preaching with this, and uh, well, that was the end of him. <laughs> They liked to burn just about anybody, it seemed like back then. Giordano Bruno, Savonarola, didn't matter if you were an atheist or nope. preachers. Just don't disagree with the wrong people. Right. This Bible is not in the best shape the Bible could possibly be in. As you can probably tell, it's coming apart in more than a few ways. But what's interesting about this Bible is that it's at least three distinct entities that it starts with the Book of Common Prayer, um, the Book of Common Prayer is from 1629. In the back half, then there's a Sternholden uh, Hopkins Psalter, which is dated 1594. And then the interior of the Bible is at least two different Bibles stuck together. One's a Geneva, and one's the King James Version, and they kind of go back and forth between them, all with different dates. And a few places, particularly here, I don't know if you can see it, but this page is much smaller, it's from a totally different copy of the Bible which they uh, stuck into this because the other pages were missing. So this is a very, very strange pastiche of at least three to four entities of... Um, Who would have owned something like that? Oh, this is pretty common for... Well, almost anyone would own a Bible. But and I mean, that, that kind of... So sometimes you three, have to, two different Bibles. If you have some damaged Bibles and you're trying to sell it, you uh, can, you know, take what you can and try to make an entity out of it. Kind of a make a lemonade situation. <laughs> This is a 1692 copy of the works of Ben Jonson. 
Wow, that's so, impressive. So Ben Johnson was a famous playwright of his time as well. One of the others in that important tradition. So this is, is added a comedy called New Inn. So uh, the works have been... So we also have his other plays, Every Man in His Humor, Every Man Out of His Humor, Cynthia's Revels, uh, Poet After, Sejanus, The Fox, Silent Woman, The Alchemist, and on and on. So this is a lovely work of early theater. <clears throat> and... Is Ben Johnson performed at all anymore? I mean, does very he... occasionally. Um, do you ever do it here? We had talked for a very long time about performing The Alchemist. We might have actually performed The Alchemist, I might have forgotten it, but okay. it happens occasionally, like Renaissance. There's so much Renaissance theater that to limit yourself to just Shakespeare, it feels like you're somewhat missing out. So um, we have... Oh, I want to get to that last. So... Uh, this is a 1640 edition of the Sermons of John Donne. As I mentioned earlier, it's, if you're studying the Renaissance, there's a lot about religion. So, and naturally I bring up all the heavy folios to show off. Um, they're impressive. There is, I didn't bring it up, there's an, piece of, uh, there's an antiphonal we have downstairs, which is uh, music meant to be, it's church music meant to be sung by the entire choir, so the book itself is about... Yay, when you open it up and you can it read weighs. It from far away, right. And it weighs a ton. Um, Thomas Haywood is a play is uh, most known as a playwright, but he also wrote this, which is the hierarchy of blessed angels. Um, and this is uh, from sixteen thirty four. And I also just love the title page on this one. And after Haywood, there is, that was done. That was Ben Johnson. Good, good, good. I've got these three left. So let us talk about gardens. <clears throat> good day, too. Sixteen. This is a 1633 copy of Gerard's Herbal. This was an enormously influential book um, in the Renaissance and even for a while after. This is a very extensive catalog of plants. Their uses, where to find them, where they're from, and illustrations of all of the above. Are those um, woodblock prints? Mm hmm And this is uh, one of the primary works consulted for the making of all of our gardens. So most of the information we use all comes from this. So this is a very, very important book for that. You can see your gardens from here. So. Indeed. So that's uh, this is one of the works that was consulted. Um, you'll probably want to actually bring the camera over here for this one so you can look at it. This has also seen better days. But this is a 1564 edition of Adam Lanaser's Kreuter book, which we mentioned earlier. So Kreuter book is German for herb book. Um, however, that's slightly misleading since he talks a whole lot more than just herbs um, in this one. So what is great about this one, in addition to all of the illustrations, is the amount of color that's present in it. So we have this kind of title page, then we have a whole lot of loose pages, which is unfortunate, but sometimes that happens. And then we get into the book itself, which includes, at the start, distilling. And a lot of different ways of distilling. And then after that, let me just, yeah, that's also a very nice page. Was the color added with print blocks? Uh, this was most likely done by hand. Okay. Uh, particularly for some of the works they had done later, you get then to the, the animals. Finer, the finer yep. coloring. So yeah, we have our animals here, our rats, our rodents. And uh, yeah, some of them, you know, based on sort of description. So you have the lion over here, which only slightly looks like a lion. Um, you have our hedgehog there. And we move from beyond the animals then into crocodiles and other lizards and the basilisk. Um, yeah, you've got to have them all. Like you do. Then some bugs. Then birds. Then eventually we get on to uh, sea life. Fishes and such like that. And... Then we get to the herb parts and how to plant trees, 
and the types of trees you have. Would this have been a very expensive book? In this, this would have been pricey, particularly because of all this hand color. And so you can see on things like this where the uh, artist probably wasn't all that interested in filling out everything exactly and thought I'll just throw some green down and it'll be on the leaf area. <laughs> so, and yeah, now this is colored throughout. So this is just a beautiful book, um, which has unfortunately fallen, but... Uh, what happens to these books so often is they become breakers. People just yep. take the pages and frame them. Okay. Uh, this is one of our unique pieces. This is from the convent of Santa Clara in Alocer, Spain. <clears throat> this is their daily record of what goes on in the convent itself. Wow, that is unique. And it's upside down. And that right side up. This is all handwritten, and this covers uh, goes from the 16th to about the 18th century. There's uh, one or two hands in here. Mostly this is copied over from previous books. Um, and this is wholly unique. Uh, but also Really a window into their daily lives. Yeah. yeah. And uh, most important, because that convent is now abandoned. Um, so this was lost for a whole lot of time and found in a bookstore. So, uh, but yeah, this is one of our unique pieces. And currently, this exists only in Spanish. There has not been a translation done of it. So if anyone reads Spanish and needs a topic for their master's thesis, it's right here, just waiting. <clears throat> so a couple unique things that are also nice. So we have, yes, we have a few leaves, which normally I just keep in acid-free folders. So yeah, things that get kind of torn out and made for displays is this is an illuminated leaf from a French book of hours. So this is 15th century, and this is just some lovely work. Then also, this leaf is, you know, it's very tiny art, see this is from Ezekiel, um, and the cellar notes indicate 13th century. So this is, if that's accurate anyway, this is the oldest thing we have in the building. Mm -hmm. and. You know, just so everyone knows, I have washed my hands very recently. And now it's going to go back in this folder and be very, very safe. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I was talking to an archivist recently and she mentioned that um, a lot of times in a rare book room they'll give you gloves to wear. Yeah. And a lot of times the gloves do more damage mm -hmm. to the paper than if you were just using your bare hands washed, this is, of course. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. As long as your hands are washed and dried, you're better off. Also because for something like that, I can feel it tactically and I know how hard I'm gripping and whether or not I'm going to drop yeah. it or break it or do something terrible to it. And so this is from a manu this is a late 15th century leaf from Manual for Baptism. And this is one of our pieces of music which I haven't had a chance to show off yet. So this is a uh, this is called horseshoe nail music because of the way it's designed and yeah, this is 15th century. What was the word? Horseshoe nail. It looks horseshoe like nail. Yes, okay. horseshoe nail like the uh, nails that go in horseshoes. So, that is a very, very, very brief look at uh, just a few pieces of the collection. Well, Jeff, thanks so much uh, for showing us some of your collection. You're, you're the librarian here, so we got really first-hand uh, tour and first-hand showing of some of your nicer pieces. Thank you so much. And absolutely come back sometime and I can show more. All right, we'll do. Say, hey, 
What would have happened if they took another call? Did I do family judgment? I think people are so hard. Yes. Yeah. It, her hair was really hard. Her hair was like friends. Yeah. Her so hair I'm kind of used to. Fine hair is really hard because it's really hard to get smooth. I think you need to use more gel. Oh! One to one. Go back. It was well caught. One to one. Play next. Automatic illuminating machine. It's a wee man, very wee. Oh, that's a It's very wee to fit inside that small box. I will show him to you. I show you to him. I see him. He, care, he says that you're a fair beauty. Oh, he just compliment us. It made his day. That's the outside of the bell, and this is the classroom. And then you have to like, yeah, exactly. Throw it away, and you have to let that that one. You can if you pull it in with your with your finger, you have to get it so you don't pull it in with your finger, so it it, it can roll later on when you start to turn them over. It's okay to kind of hold using your finger to keep it from bouncing back again, but.
Silver hates rapiers. He yes. finds them annoying and they're killing his students. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> 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 
completely different range. Yeah, no. That is the worst they did. Have it. Hold on. You get my heart. Get this thing out. But that's the thing, too, is that if you end up in a duel, that is that. Yeah. All right, now the clothes come off. All right, we're doing that this. Some of our uh, some of our manuscripts were. What? You know? Show, uh, like, it takes it takes it takes fighting philosophies and geometry. We're looking at Renaissance. Post Renaissance. We're looking at everything we can find there. Geometry is the big name. Mathematics and everything. We can bring this down to the science rather than by what works. Yeah. 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 Stuff like that too. Because yeah. even like we're silver and. It's like... <laughs>